Hi, good morning. I'm Kate Chapman. I'm the executive director of the Humanitarian Open Street Map team, and I'm excited to do the first, I believe the first LCA, Humanitarian Open Source Mini Comp. This was actually an idea five or six years ago. Someone asked me if I wanted to come to Australia and participate in a open, uh, hum humanitarian open source mini comp, but I wasn't involved in the LCA community at the time, and Aus Australia then seemed really far away. Uh, so this is my third time at LCA, and I'm excited to bring together a great group of speakers today to talk about their individual projects that uh, use open source software specifically for humanitarian related purposes. Uh, I wanted to do a quick little hand survey of the room to get so that we'd all get an idea of where people's backgrounds are from. Uh, and the first is just a simple question of how many people uh, participate in a HFOS project or have supported software that's used for humanitarian purposes. So we have a couple. Um, Who's uh, implemented software in what would be considered low or middle income countries? Some people call them develop developing countries, the global south, which is a bit weird since we're in New Zealand. That, that sort of world of there's not a good politically correct term for it. <laughs> okay. Uh, and who's supported software being used actively to respond to a crisis? So... A lot of experience sort of in that realm. Okay, good to know where people are coming from. I guess the other side is who's here because they're interested in the world of HFOS and don't know too much about it. Okay, great. So I'm going to start off and give a presentation about a specific project that the Humanitarian Open Street Map team works on. And following me, it, the, awkward, the order's a little awkward, uh, but uh, Chris Daly is going to actually give an introduction to humanitarian response, so outside of open source software, because there's a bureaucratic structure and method and cycle of the way that works, and I think it's good to have an idea about it, because when I became involved in HFOS, I actually didn't know anything about it myself. Uh, so first I'm, first I'm going to talk about the Missing Maps project. And to not get too far ahead of myself, uh, so as I said, I'm the executive director of the Humanitarian Open Street Map Team. We use open source and open data to help communities in vulnerable areas better respond and prepare to, uh, for crises. And I, I actually gave a keynote last year at LCA about our overall mission and project. This is a very specific project that we just launched in November of this year. So I'd like to go back to 1864 to talk about why maps today are important. So this is John Snow. He was a physician in London. He was the first person to use maps to do uh, in the field of medical geography and epidemiology. And so what he did uh, is there was a cholera outbreak. And at the time, people believed that cholera came from bad air, not from the water. And he had a suspicion that it was actually coming from a specific water pump on Broad Street in London. So this is his map. And simply what he did is he mapped the pumps and the cholera cases. And you could see that they're clustered around this one specific pump. Uh, he actually did this mapping after the fact. But prior to this, he was convincing enough to the local council to convince them to move, remove the pump handle off of the pump and the cholera outbreak subsided rather quickly. But to really show that it was, in fact, that he created this map. But picture the road information that he's sticking the cases and the pumps on top of. If you don't have that basic information, you can't make the map at all. Um, you could have those dots, but they would mean nothing. So, believe it or not, this is still very much a problem. Uh, there's plenty of countries and localities where there's blank spots. Uh, that's for a variety of reasons, from um, sometimes uh, 
the data does exist, but it's not really accessible. Maybe only the government has it. Maybe only one department in the government has it, and they don't share it with the other departments. Uh, or maybe it's just not up to date. Maybe there's commercial data available, but it's cost prohibitive. Uh, or maybe there isn't because it's not a economic, viewed as an economically viable place to map for commercial reasons. So in comes the Missing Maps Project. So our goal is in the next two years to help map 20 million of the most vulnerable people in the world. And the reason for this is by having that basic map information, very much as Jon Snow did, we can map things like cholera cases, Ebola, also disasters uh, such as Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, uh, the earthquake in Haiti. Having basic geographic information allows you to just simply make better decisions. You can imagine you're trying to route from point A to point B. You could use a map and a routing algorithm to find the most effective way, or you could just drive down the road with a truck and hope you can make it. So what's been really exciting for us, the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, is this is the first time we've really formally partnered with large humanitarian organizations. And this is really what the difference is. Uh, we've been creating maps that have been used in response since 2009. Our community originally would just come together and take uh, open data, satellite information, and you can imagine with satellite pictures, trace over it to pull out roads and buildings and things like that. But maybe people would use it, and often they did, because uh, it would be the best source of base information, but we weren't formally pre-mapping areas, really. And so, by working with the American and British Red Cross, and also Doctors Without Borders UK, we're working together in places to pre-map. As I said before, it's really about putting the world's vulnerable people on a map. But this, is, this isn't people in the sense of watching us walk around. This is that base map data that I've been talking about. Uh, what's been really important is our core ethics. Um, and you'll hear about the core ethics of humanitarian response as well in the next talk. Um, so for us, what's really important is open. Uh, open as in open source, open collaboration, and open data. Uh, being respectful. And being respectful really means being respectful of local communities and also local access. So often what the issue is, is data has been created, but local people have no access to it. And that can really mean things like needing to provide technology and training so people can access it. And sometimes it's honestly printing. We do a lot of printing. Uh, for example, uh, in 2012, HOT uh, worked with partners to map Jakarta for flood preparedness. There's 267 urban villages in Jakarta. We printed a poster map to, for, of every single one of those villages. Later that year when there was flooding, we went back. People were using those printed maps because there's not typically computers in the local government offices there. So it's really thinking about how we can work with the local communities to help them create the maps, but also then use them, not just taking data. So we're doing this as a three-step process. Uh, one of the big parts of it is we're gathering remote volunteers to trace satellite information. Uh, and this is done both people from the comfort of their own homes as, as well as in uh, events. Uh, there's monthly events in Washington, D.C. and London at the moment. Uh, we're hoping to ha add others. Uh, there's one in Portland, Oregon on Saturday. And what this does is essentially it's vectorizing the satellite information so that there's actual data sets of roads and buildings. And what that means is you can then attach other information to it. Uh, so then when we go and actually do step two, mapping with community volunteers, we can print maps and have people write road names, details about buildings, and that sort of information, and then put that back into OpenStreetMap so that there's detailed information, a detailed database of an area. And then third is simply use. Uh, so international, non-government organizations, governments, local groups, uh, local communities are able to actually plan in case of disaster and also respond.
this is just simply a picture of one of our mapping parties. Uh, I like to point out one thing that I've also noticed a little bit in this room as well is OpenStreetMap is not very gender diverse, but the Missing Maps Project, we uh, um, are getting, there's a ton of minorities and women and groups that we don't normally see in our project. And and it's been really exciting. And I think some of it is just, we've been a little more newbie uh, friendly. Um, and some of that is just having really great people from the American Red Cross, the British Red Cross and MSF involved who are coming at it from a fresh, uh, fresh set of eyes. So MSF UK provides a half-time communication specialist. So he's come to OpenStreetMap from only a communications background. And so it's really allowed us to approach things in a different way. So after those groups um, digitize that information, it's then printed onto paper maps and data is collected in those communities. So these are individuals from the U University of Lubumbashi in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And they're using a software called Field Papers. Uh, and so Field Papers is a website where you can print an atlas of maps. They have a QR marker on them and then other uh, markers. And what that allows you to do is you just take the map, treat it like a regular map and write on it, but you can take a picture of it and upload it. And then it's already referenced geographically to the other information. So imagine you have your field paper here and your open street map data. You can view them together to transcribe your notes. Uh, and then here is a a team from the Red Cross using OpenStreetMap data in Haiyan, uh, after Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. So they're using it both as printed maps and on tablets. And they're using it to plan their response. They also did a preliminary uh, test of using OpenStreetMap data as part of their damage assessment, which um, essentially we asked volunteers to rate damage based on the satellite information. It proved not to work all that well. Um, but we're looking at ways that we can improve that. Because uh, one of the big things with a lot of the OpenStreetMap tools, it wasn't built with this in mind at all. It was built to create a free map of the entire world. So there's aspects that are used in traditional geographic information systems that are missing. A really simple one, for example, is if you're looking at a satellite picture and you turn it, it looks different. So if you're trying to imagine your perspective of mapping of a building's damaged or not, just turning 90 degrees makes it a little easier, but none of the OpenStreetMap software does that. So it's a simple example of things we'd like to improve to be able to uh, better do this sort of work. Uh, so this is, um, I wanted to get into the software of what we use, primarily web applications. So at the core of the Missing Maps project, and actually all of HOT's uh, disaster response related work is what we call the OpenStreetMap Tasking Manager. And what this does is you highlight an area, it divides it into squares, and then you can ask people to take a square. So essentially a check in, check out to say, hey, I'm working on this square. And the reason for this is originally, uh, when people originally started doing mapping five years ago, the way you helped is you had to just go find a blank spot. This way we can track coverage, um, volunteers can ask questions, we can uh, give them new uh, data sources of satellite data, those sorts of things. And this is a web editor. This is just on the front of OpenStreetMap.org. So if you went to OpenStreetMap, had, had an account signed in, you'd get this editor, which is known as ID. And so a lot of people use ID because um, you don't need to download any software or, or do anything else. You can do this from the comfort of your own home. So that essentially you start in the tasking manager, you select an area, and then it'll open it here and you can begin mapping. And then once again, after it's digitized out in the field, this is a, uh, staff from Doctors Without Borders UK, uh, working with, once again, from students from the University of Lubumbashi to collect information there. So 
hopefully some of you are interested in getting involved, so I wanted to highlight some of those ways as well. Uh, the simplest way is to map. Um, donations are always great as well. And you can also sign up, uh, sign up to our mailing lists, um, follow HOTS website, Twitter, uh, and there's different ways to join in. We'll be launching as well a field roster for Missing Maps field, field deployment in the next week. And what that is, it's you can sign up to go with these organizations to help do the field mapping. Uh, we definitely will need people with experience when we first start doing this, but we're looking at ways we can train people and get people involved as well. We have done training before in the past, um, internships and volunteerships. Uh, we're an experienced person, an experienced person work together to get those skills. A lot of the people who volunteer and also contract for HOT come from either a humanitarian GIS background or a tech background and then have gained um, field experience through HOT. Um, myself, for example, I was a web developer and um, got involved in 2010 and started going with an experienced humanitarian worker uh, to work on these sorts of projects. Uh, Hosting mapping parties is great. So as I mentioned, we have in-person events. Uh, we have a lot of great uh, documentation now. Uh, this is a little tabletop tent uh, that you can put at tables uh, at your mapathon so people can follow us through the instructions. And then behind it is instructions. Um, so we love people that want to organize these sorts of events. Uh, you don't need a lot of experience, and we can support you and get you started in that as well. Uh, for example, the Mapathon in Portland that happened on Saturday, we're supporting an intern through the GNOME Outreach Program for Women. And so she was not involved in OpenStreetMap at all until about a month, month and a half ago, and organized a Mapathon and some of the other OpenStreetMap communi community in the area that normally map their homes and the areas in Portland joined in to help her. So, as I said, there's still a lot of blank spots on the map. Um, one of the things we're working on are where are the unmapped people? Um, how do you know that? Uh, so that we know what areas to focus on. And we're, hope, we're hoping, you know, there's eventually a day where there aren't those unmapped people. So if any of this sounded interesting, come talk to me at any time. Um, we'd love to have more volunteers. And if we all work together, everyone hopefully in this room uh, is used to the open source ethos of collaboration and it's no different in mapping. We can really uh, make a difference. So thank you very much.